Good evening. I'm Chris Aylward, the National President for the Public Service Alliance of Canada. I want to thank you for taking the time and making the effort to attend this webinar. Recently, the Auditor General, Michael Ferguson, called Phoenix an incomprehensible failure. And we couldn't agree more. That's why we're calling on the Prime Minister to initiate a public inquiry into what went wrong and what's still going wrong with Phoenix. We're also asking the government to pay damages to our members for the mental anguish and the stress they have endured for the past two and a half years. Our members have shown tremendous commitment and loyalty to this government and to Canadians, going to work each and every day without knowing whether they're going to get paid or not. It is simply not fair nor right for federal public sector workers to have to pay the price for this Phoenix mess. While PSAC is fighting hard for action by the Prime Minister and this government, we're also doing everything we can to help members resolve their pay problems. And this has been a big challenge. The Phoenix system now has over a half a million backlog cases, and we know it's going to take a long time to get things running smoothly. This is why the work you do as pay advocates is so very important to assist the members and we certainly appreciate it. We know being a pay advocate can be challenging and frustrating. This is why we want to step up the support that we are giving you. This is what this webinar is all about. It will give you updated information about pay issues. It will give you a chance to have your questions answered. And it will give you a chance to interact with others. Thank you again for all the work that you're doing for your fellow members and on behalf of the PSAC. And thank you for participating in tonight's webinar. We hope you will get a lot out of it. And please don't hesitate to provide feedback on this experience because we want to make sure you are getting the support that you need. Thank you again and have a great seminar. So that's a message from our national president, Chris Elward. We'll now um, uh, do one more poll question before we uh, begin here. Just uh, let me pull that up. So we're looking to see if you've assisted um, a member with a um, uh, pay issue. So most of you have uh, completed the poll. I'll just give you another second or two. Just gauging our audience participants, how many of you have had an opportunity to assist a member? All right, so I'll close the poll, share the results with you. So 77% yes so far, 23% no. Um, perhaps you'll have the opportunity to assist a member in the future. Um, we shall see. So what I'd like to do now is hand the um, presentation over to colleague uh, Donna Lackey, who will be uh, doing our first uh, presentation on pay issues. So good evening. Before we get started, I think it's important um, for all of you listening to me that uh, I remind you that we are not compensation advisors, nor is it our intent to provide any solutions to particular members' pay issues during this webinar. It's our goal this evening to review current trends and pain issues come to our attention on a daily basis and explain how these problems evolve. The common pain issues that I'm going to talk to you about tonight may be familiar to you and your members, and some may also be new. If you are experiencing pain issues uh, for your members that you do not see included in this evening's webinar, please forward them to the PSAC and we will show a response. As you are all aware, the processing of the Government of Canada payroll represents some of it, which represents some of the most complicated pay systems um, in the country. Uh, it is impacting the loss of thousands of qualified and experienced compensation advisors, saddled with the fact that it's a poor performing payroll system, and over the last three years our members have had to bear the financial fallout. We're very interested in hearing about any successes you've had as pay advocates in helping our members navigate the Phoenix data system. What has worked and what has not worked? I would like to encourage you to submit your questions at the end of the 
pay a student's presentation in order to ensure we get through the entire presentation. Immediately following the pay a student's presentation, we will be presenting the grievances process. Enhancements, really, really important enhancements that I'd like to take a moment before I start to talk about them. So recent enhancements for pay systems and pay problems, there is a new enhanced client contact center. All the agents are now government accounting employees, or PSCC members, who have access to both Phoenix and the CMT, which is the case management tool. This allows them to provide better information to their clients or our members. As well, not only do they have access to Phoenix in the case management tool, but they've received weeks of training on Phoenix. So please, I would encourage that you have your members call this new call center. Again, it's staffed by PSAC members who have access to information. And so the client contact number is now on the screen. Um, and have your members pick options one through four that apply to their particular pay issues. Um, and you can do this prior to submitting a prior even. If a member has a new pay issue, they can call the contact center. Um, they can do both. But please know that this is a newly enhanced system. The PSAC worked very hard to ensure there was no more contract workers at this client contact center. So they are now uh, public service employees. One of the first issues I want to talk about, and there will be 10 that we have. The first one I want to talk about is acting assignments. For those of you who have struggled with your own issues around acting assignments or issues for your members, acting assignments are an error-prone transaction, which can end up leading to uh, overpayments or actually no payment situations. Some of the causes of delays in processing of acting assignments are just indicating start, stop and start dates. One of the most difficult situations we have is, is uh, the entry of acting assignments after the acting assignment has started, which makes it very difficult to process acting pays timely. Uh, the other issue that causes uh, the collapse of acting assignments and the payments of acting assignments are the attempts to correct errors. Um, this is not, so, this is not uh, supportive, this, and this ends up causing more problems in the end. Um, so we have struggled with acting assignments. We have seen an incredible increase, though, and the pay center's ability to improve the timely processing of acting assignments. If you have members with issues around acting, the four steps are listed there. Call the client contact center, submit a pay action request, a PAR, have the member request a priority payment from their Section 34 manager, and keep a detailed record of all pay issues relating to that acting assignment. Number two, common issue for us, are the transfer in and transfer out cases. Um, for those of you who go from one department to another, you will have experienced this. So what ends up happening, the process is not completed by both departments. So if somebody's leaving the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and going to RCMP, if you're leaving Fisheries and Oceans, your HR team has to take that file and transfer it to the pay center and the pay center then will do all the processes necessary and then transfer that data down to RCMP. Unfortunately, that's a complicated process. It's time consuming. It's not done quickly. And so the member sometimes struggles with issues around access to pay, the proper pay and pay levels. And certainly, they don't have access to any of their entitlements. So some of the causes is the coordination of multiple resources. Again, this would be involve three different groups the outgoing department, the pay center, and the incoming department. It's a complex process with a backlog in HR and pay transactions currently, so this isn't, these issues of transfers in and out aren't always timely. The delay in the paperwork, the delays in the letters of offer, and the acting approval of the leave. A lot of managers, a lot of Section 34 managers are simply unaware of the processes, and it's a complicated process. Um, and the prescribed process for transfers in and transfer down are not followed. Again, like every single step I'll talk about tonight, the next step is that you would call the client contact center, submit a pay action request, request a priority payment if you're not, your member's not being paid, and keep a detailed record of those pay issues.
in 2016 and certainly into 2017, overtime was a very big concern and big issue for our members. Members were simply not being paid their overtime entitlements. Some of those causes were certainly the late entry of overtime. There are cutoff dates on every calendar, every two weeks, um, and all Section 34 managers know those cutoff dates. Overtime must be entered by the cutoff point. There are cases also of our members delaying the input of their overtime into the system, so it's important to be supportive of our members so they understand the priority of deadlines. The Section 34 manager just simply does not get around to approving it, so it misses the deadline. Very difficult to amend it once it's entered into the system. And again, given the massive uh, backlog of cases, um, any delays or errors in overtime um, can become part of a backlog. Again, that we've seen great improvements in overtime. So if your members are experiencing issues around overtime, call the client contact center, have them call with their name and their phone number, submit a PAR, request a priority pay from their Section 34 manager, and keep a detailed record of those pay issues. Leave without pay. We have many members who go on leave without pay, on sick leave without pay, and it's absolutely critical that their pay is stopped. We have found hundreds and hundreds of cases where people's pay is not stopped, and it's certainly not stopped on time, resulting in massive overpayments that our members have to deal with when they return from leave without pay. So the causes of leave without pay are the transactions are late entering into the system and the current backlog of transactions pending. Um, call the client contact center, have your members call the client contact center, sub submit a pay action request to support that call and that issue. If the member ends up with an overpayment, I just want to uh, remind everybody that uh, the PSAC with Treasury Board negotiated a document called Flexibilities on the Recovery of Emergency Salary Advances, Priority Payments, and Overpayments. So if your member returns from leave without pay and, for, and has a large overpayment or has any overpayment, please know that they must be effective now, notified in writing when their recovery will start. All monies owing to them must be paid out and their pay file must be reconciled. The employee experiences three accurate or consecutive pay periods without any deductions and then a reasonable repayment plan has been agreed to by the employee. Keep a detailed record of all paying issues. Maternity and paternal leave. This has also been a very large problem for members going off on leave. The delays in processing this benefit have been immense. Difficulties obtaining records of employment, ROEs, which are required in order to apply for these employment insurance benefits. If those ROEs are not generated, it causes a delay in receiving benefits. Although we've been very successful with many of our members who've been able to work with uh, Service Canada to with their pay stubs to actually get the file, their pay file started. Late entry and approvals of, to PeopleSoft and approvals by Section 34 managers have also resulted in many delays for maternity and paternal leave. Contact your manager to ensure your pay is stopped. Call the client contact center, submit a pay action request, request a priority pay, speak to your manager, your section 34 manager. There is agreement, there are agreements in place with all departments that if you're not receiving uh, your um, employment and your employment insurance or your top up from the department, you can request a priority pay until your file has been approved. Keep a detailed record of all pay issues. Disability leave. This is about applying for DI coverage, whether it's through uh, Alliance, Industrial Alliance, or Sun Life. The effect of this is you simply don't receive your benefits. The pay system relates to disability insurance payments due to information by the employer in Sun Life, from the member to Sun Life, and delays in the pay center. As all of you know, the pay center also plays a role in verifying and approving uh, your group and level and your income levels to be sent to Sun Life for um, entitlement, insurance entitlements. Sun Life cannot process any DI claims until all information is submitted. So 
call the client contact center. If the following circumstances apply, contact your manager. You're experiencing financial hardship. The employer statement or the record of employment is delayed. The 13-week waiting, waiting period, or you've used all bank sick leave, and you're already not receiving EI benefits. The manager and HR will determine the course of action. Request a priority pay. Benefits, dental, uh, both dental and health. Coverage is stopped or for no apparent reason is never started. We're having more uh, experiences with uh, new employees to government whose files are not being set up in, um, in PeopleSoft or in Phoenix to initiate uh, health and dental benefits. New hire enrollment must be started by the pay center. So uh, given the, the amount of workload there, we're seeing delays in, in those entries. It's a manual process, and it contributes to a workload issues and backlog. If you have members who have suddenly lost access to their benefits for dental and health or their new employees, please have them call the client contact center, submit a, a PAR. You can also forward the cases to me as well, and um, I can also able to escalate cases for dental and health care. Income tax implications. We've had hundreds and hundreds of cases uh, this year again of errors in T4 information due to over and underpayments. Pay irregularities such as overpayments and underpayments have been the cause of income tax issues in both 2016 and 2017. Call the client contact center and, and follow and register the fact that you, you require an amended T4 or your T4 is incorrect. For information about income tax, government benefits, or credit related to income tax, we have a website on the PSCC site on the frequently asked questions, and you will see a link to a Revenue Canada site that will address some of these concerns as well. If you've experienced pay issues, you are eligible for reimbursement of up to $200 for tax advice services as well. One of the biggest established trends over certainly this last year has been for our members uh, who recently retired and are waiting up to as much as two years to gain access to their severance pay and all entitlements, outstanding vacation leave, um, you know, uh, overtime, any pay entitlements, they're waiting up to two years. And um, it's forcing them to put their personal plans on hold and put their lives on hold. It's a massive backlog of severance cases, um, and there's a fair bit of work involved, obviously, with uh, reconciling and closing um, members' pay files. Uh, severance isn't necessarily uh, being considered a priority, um, and I do want to remind everybody that regardless of our members not receiving their severance or their outstanding pay entitlements, please have members call the pension center Public Service Superannuation Center in Cheyenne, Brunswick, and speak to a pay pension agent, and they will advise them and support them in moving ahead and applying for their pensions. Once their pay files have been reconciled, all the updated information will be transferred to the pension center, and their pensions will be adjusted to reflect the appropriate incomes. So call the client contact center, submit a pay action request, keep a detailed record of pay issues, I would also encourage that you send severance cases to my attention, and we will do everything we can to um, escalate those cases to the passenger on behalf of our retired members. And our last issue is union dues. And this is one has, that has been so um, very, very, very difficult for us and for our members. We get emails almost every day from our members saying, I've been working here for six months, I've been working here for a year, my union dues have not started. They haven't started or they have stopped, resulting in arrears. So there's incorrect dues amounts and our membership status is incorrect. So even the data that we have within our union order is not accurate. Not paying our union dues is, is a result of, of a backlog and it's not considered a priority. 
call the client contact center, inform your manager, submit a pay action request to start or stop your dues, keep a detailed record, and send an email to the PSAC to remain a member in good standing. This will be really helpful for the PSAC data information. Hi, my name is Andrew Beck. I'm a grievance and adjudication officer with the PSAC, and uh, I'll be doing a brief presentation on uh, grievances and special considerations for Phoenix-related grievances. So the objective here isn't to do a comprehensive uh, review of how to navigate the grievance procedure and how to file grievances, but just to highlight some of the special considerations that might apply to uh, grievances concerning pay issues. Um, one of the most useful things that grievance, uh, filing a grievance can do for your member is, uh, is the procedure itself requires members of management to sit down, meet with you, and discuss the issue. Um, Phoenix pay problems have led to sort of a unique circumstance where we're filing grievances that the employer uh, may very well uh, and, and often grants. Uh, they agree that they owe us money, uh, that they owe the members their correct pay, um, but they're failing to provide that pay in a timely manner. Um, so in those cases, the, the grievance procedure itself becomes more important because the opportunity to sit down with management, discuss potential solutions, and get to the root issue behind a particular member's pay problem um, becomes more important. Uh, filing a grievance is something that can be done at the same time as you're taking other the other pay actions that uh, we've highlighted um, in terms of contacting the uh, client call center uh, and supporting the members in other ways. Um, the normal rules for filing a grievance continue to apply, so there's uh, 25 days after the you become aware of the incident giving rise to the grievance, you should be filing a grievance. Uh, and for situations we'll be discussing a little later where you make a claim through the Treasury Board claims process, um, you have 25 days after, if a claim is denied, you have 25 days after that claim is denied to uh, file a grievance concerning that denial. Um, we would encourage people to file grievances even if they're outside that 25-day timeline if they feel that that will, uh, if, if they wish to file a grievance, and we'll do our best to support them um, because uh, the collective agreement gives you the right to try to resolve issues informally before uh, resorting to a grievance. And in our view, contacting the employer and attempting to resolve your pay issue through filing a pay action request, contacting the client contact center or taking the other steps that you're going to take assisting members to resolve their pay issue. Uh, in our view, that is an informal attempt to resolve a dispute. Um, if you wanted to be, as pay advocates, especially helpful in preserving a member's right to grieve, uh, you can specifically cite in the in the PA agreement, it's Article 18.07, there is an equivalent article in every collective agreement. Um, you can at the same time as the member is coming to you to say, hey, I need help resolving this pay issue, when you approach management uh, the first time to flag for them that we're not filing a grievance right now, but we are putting you on notice that this is an attempt to resolve this informally and we're taking advantage of the clause that I've got on your screen there right now. Um, and this pauses the timeline until such a time as, uh, until such a time as the member either has their problem resolved, hopefully, or decides that they no longer want to wait and wish to file a grievance. Um, the exception to the wait and see rule, I guess, would be we would certainly encourage members who may have a human rights claim to file a grievance as soon as possible. Um, this most often is in cases where members are going on or returning from leave without pay, uh, either in connection with uh, long-term disability or uh, maternity and parental leave. Um, but obviously that's not comprehensive. It's something you've discussed one-on-one -on -one with the members uh, 
or rather uh, should be encouraging the members to discuss with their uh, stewards and their component representatives um, if they wish to file a grievance. Uh, again, obviously, we're working alongside the uh, component reps and local stewards in terms of the grievance language, and there's uh, resources that uh, are available for uh, from the PSAC on drafting grievances generally. Um, at, a, at a high level, there's nothing special about grieving a Phoenix issue. Uh, you want to identify um, specifically what pay issue you're grieving, what what didn't happen that should have happened, or what did happen that shouldn't have happened. Uh, and generally, the article of the collective agreement we're citing is the uh, pay administration article. Um, and if there's a human rights violation, then specific language about the human rights violation should be included as well. One of the questions that we see a lot and to assist you in providing members with uh, some information and setting expectations uh, is a, a limitation of the jurisdiction of the Federal Public Service Labor Relations and Employment Board, which is ultimately, if your grievance goes through all the levels of the grievance procedure, is the adjudicative board that has the final say on a grievance. Uh, they don't have the ability to award interest. If they say, yes, the government owed you money and we order them to pay it to you, uh, they do not have jurisdiction to say, and they should pay you this amount of interest on that money. We uh, do encourage members to claim it. Uh, there's no harm in asking. The, the worst case scenario is that they go through the whole system and the board may say no. And this is uh, distinct from interest on if you had to borrow money because you weren't paid properly and you uh, paid interest on the money you borrowed, you can go to the claims uh, through the Treasury Board's claims process and claim that interest. Uh, and so we would encourage you to discuss that option with your members as well. But uh, for interest, meaning the government didn't pay you and the board later orders them to pay you, uh, the board doesn't have the power to order interest on that. Um, and so we see that question on, you know, I've effectively given the government a loan, will I get interest on it at the end of the day? Uh, the board doesn't have the power to give that to you, but certainly uh, no harm in asking. And if you had to borrow money to cover uh, when the government failed to pay you, then you can claim that interest through the Treasury Board's claims process, which is the next section of the presentation. Um, so we'll move on to uh, our presentation momentarily, but just because I like polls, so just asking how many of, uh, of you have uh, had the opportunity to provide assistance with uh, a pay issue, so in a, the role of a pay advocate. That's great. So most of you have completed that. So we'll close the poll share the results. So we have 81% uh, having had that opportunity and 19% not yet, or perhaps um, uh, as we uh, move forward and um, you engage more as a pay advocate, you'll have that opportunity. And our goal here is to make sure that everybody is ready uh, to occupy that role of pay advocate. So I'm going to uh, hand over the presentation now to uh, Donna Lackey, and uh, Donna, if you introduce yourself and uh, have a great presentation. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Donna Lackey, uh, PSAC Special Project Officer, and my portfolio is definitely the Phoenix Bay file. And so what I'm going to do uh, for the next few minutes is I'm going to go through the Treasury Board claims process with you. And so the uh, expense claims process has been in place since the fall of 2017. And by the end of May of this year, 2018, only slightly less than 3,000 um, of our members have actually submitted claims, which is not a lot when you consider that 280,000 employees are paid by the Phoenix Pay system. 
for approximately 75 to 80 percent of employees have been affected by a pay issue. So in your role as pay advocates, it will be very important that you advise our members of this process and encourage them to use it. Some additional stats I might share with you on this issue before I start. That 87 percent of claims to Treasury Board um, for out-of-pocket expenses and expenses incurred, 87 percent were fully or partially approved, only 9 percent were denied, and 4 percent continue uh, as pending because they're missing information or um, it's their standard review. As well, uh, of, of interest, um, 396 claims were above $500 for a total claim amount to date of a little bit over $1.5 million. Um, and 61% of the claims submitted to Treasury Board um, represent 10 departments. So the majority of people who have filed complaints represent 10 departments, and um, I would say we probably are the two largest departments by looking at their names. So I'd like to get into um, this presentation. We will slow it down for you. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about claims that are eligible. There we go. So I'm going to talk about eligible claims first. So what is an eligible claim? First ones right off the bat are NSF and other financial penalty charges. So these will be for missed or late payments on mortgage payments. Condo fees, rents, personal loans, car, car students, and others. Interest charges from credit cards, lines of credit, or personal loans used to temporarily pay your mortgage payments, condo fees, rents, personal loan payments for cars for students, household utilities, groceries, and other household expenses. So this is the first great point off the top. Interest and related fees on loans, credit cards, and lines of credit required for the repayment of source deductions on an overpayment, which is the difference between gross and net payments. Reimbursement of increased income taxes that will not be reversed or offset from amendments to the employee's current, previous, or future income tax returns. Fees for early withdrawal of investments and withdrawals from savings accounts. Penalties and or interest claimed must be on amounts related to missing pay. So for these issues, you have to clearly demonstrate that due to your inability to receive your pay accurately and on time, these um, certain aspects of your finances were impacted. Fees are related charges from tax advisory providers to amend and previously file income tax return following the issuance of an amended tax slip. Advances or compensation for benefits if you were overpaid in 2016 or 2017 and the amount you receive from government benefits such as a child care, child tax benefit and credits may have been reduced. We've had many members call us about that one in particular because of the fact they receive inaccurate T4s for their tax years, it impacted their ability to um, access the child tax benefit. Reimbursement of tax advisory services. So this is the advisory services of an independent uh, chartered accountant or, or, or tax specialist. If you were overpaid in 2016 or 2017 during that calendar year, you were underpaid in 2016 or 2017 calendar years, your tax slips for 2016 taxation year were incorrect as of February 28, 2017 or later. And your tax slips for 2017 taxation year were incorrect as of February 28, 2018 or later. These are the ineligible expenses. Lost interest on savings accounts or other financial or capital investments, interest on outstanding pay, tax withheld and opportunity costs on investment withdrawals, 
reimbursement of source deductions related to overpayments. That is the difference between the gross and net pay. Reimbursement of increased income taxes that will be offset when the employee files or amends his or her income tax return. General damages. If you're going to submit a claim, and of course we, we fully encourage you to submit a claim, uh, the documents that you are being required to, to support your claim, uh, gather the relevant documents and receipts that show interest charges related to late or missed payments from credit cards, lines of credit, personal loans, car loans, etc. Non-sufficient funds, NSF charges, and other financial penalty charges resulting from late or missed payments for household utilities, condo fees, mortgages, and other ongoing monthly financial commitments insurance reinstatement fees, etc. Interest charges from credit cards, lines of credit, personal loans, temporarily used to pay mortgage payments, condo fees, rent, personal loan payments, household utilities, and other such expenses until the pay issue was resolved. Administrative fees or financial penalties for early withdrawal of investments or savings accounts. Documents relating to your pay, such as pay stubs, showing an incomplete or inaccurate pay. Letters of offer or other documents to confirm what should be paid. And requests for salary investments, etc. We've covered our content for this evening. Um, I want to thank you, Donna, for your um, your presentation and thank you all for, for participating. Uh, at the end of our webinar there will be a short survey for questions and we'd really appreciate you filling that out. Um, gauging how this went for you, if it's something you'd like to see more of, uh, you know, our, our goal and our role is to continue to facilitate um, uh, the work that we're doing, that you're doing around helping members to resolve these issues, your own issues, uh, and in the role of pay advocates, certainly those in your workplaces. So filling out that survey will be really helpful. So thank you so much for participating tonight, and uh, we encourage you to have a wonderful rest of your evening. And our goal will be, as I said, to continue to, to do more work this way, and if webinars are something that you are interested in, let us know by way of your survey. Thanks so much, and good night.